Good. Uh, other economic successes? Is there a lot of economic success of reconstruction? Ooh, interesting. Because that's going to lead me into your AP prompt for today, which asks, how much were, were economic factors at play for reconstruction failing? Interesting. OK, maybe that's something we can uh, kick around in our little empty heads for a little bit, is, is maybe reconstruction failed economically, and therefore it failed later politically and socially as well. Uh, political success, this one's a little easier. Give me a political success, please, George. You didn't come up with one at all. Of all the things that happened in Reconstruction that were political in nature, not one of them was a success. Go. It brought back the Union. It brought back the Union. Okay, sure. There's some easier ones as well. Go. Um, the Civil Rights Bills, as in like the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. Civil Rights Bills that are trying to uh, reduce segregation or get rid of segregation. The 13th Amendment, which abolishes slavery. Kind of important. The 14th Amendment, which guarantees citizenship. Right? That still matters today about this question of birthright citizenship. Right? Many of us have a parent born in a foreign country that came here and had a child, and now those people that are born here, regardless of the status of who brought them, citizen. Thanks, 14th Amendment. 15th Amendment, voting rights. That matters. That's a political success. Cool. Cool. How about socially? Go. Freedmen's Bureau, the biggest social success, absolutely. Pushing for things like education, things like uh, social welfare programs for the first time. That matters. Good job, Carla. Yes, Mr. Parr, you still got me. Sharecropping by uh, paid labor. Sharecropping by paid labor. Why is that a success? Because uh, slavery didn't get paid. Yeah, so at least it's, maybe it's not the success. It's not a good final solution, but it is a step in the right direction. Cool. All right. Other successes in Reconstruction we should note that we discussed either on Monday or in your reading? Successes that we should note of Reconstruction? Anybody? Yes, please. Can I ask for the patronage where um, they provided money and jobs for people? Good question. Patronage, uh, we'll talk about. Much more in period six. But to some, it may be a success. To others, that's a failure. Real quick, from your reading, this idea of patronage, like giving jobs and support to your followers, who does that remind us of? Yes, louder. I heard it. No, not Jefferson. Jackson, Jackson right? The spoil system? Yes. Oh, yeah, get rid of all these old people and give the jobs to your friends. Very Jacksonian, very Jackson-esque. Good. That's why it was a bonus point in your reading. Cool. Moving along today, we're going to talk about the fall of Reconstruction. <clears throat> Why does Reconstruction fall apart? Uh, and there's a couple reasons that we'll get into. It ends with the Compromise of 1877. But that's not why Reconstruction failed. Much like, hear me out, the Civil War begins with the election of Abraham Lincoln in 1860. But that's not why the Civil War began. The Civil War began for longer and deeper seated issues in society, largely slavery and the expansion of it. Much like, yes, this ends Reconstruction, but that's not why Reconstruction ended. Fair? Uh, and then this question of waning Northern support. Waning. What does this word mean, waning? Louder? Weakening. Weakening, yeah. Once Northern support for Reconstruction lessens, Reconstruction falls apart. So we'll get into today why Northern support weakens, or wanes, so to speak. Look at us getting our Lexile on. Good. Our key concepts are there if you are curious, but our prompt is as such. Mr. Ventura, can you read it for us, please? The AP prompt? Yeah, man, that one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, evaluate the extent to which economic factors led to the downfall of Reconstruction. So this will be a nice prompt we can write at the end that's going to look something like, although there was these factors, the real reason Reconstruction failed were this and that and the other. But we'll get there. I'll get ahead of ourselves. Cool? So before you even get into your notes, we're just going to go over some uh, some big picture items that, that are left over from Monday that are worth talking about. Um, and these are things I talked about on Monday, but it's just good getting our, our heads around why we're in this situation of Reconstruction having to succeed or fail. Shut up in my hallway. <laughs> so 
the real problem, I talked to you guys about this at the end of the Civil War, right? Like war is easy, peace is harder, right? Governing is harder. Um, we have this aftermath of two things that matter. The first is the aftermath of the war, right? In terms of our actual society, how do we put it back together? How do we put our country back together? The South is destroyed. Thanks to who? Sherman. 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 Yeah, exactly. Right? Like Atlanta's burned. Charleston is destroyed. Uh, Columbia, the capital of South Carolina, it doesn't get a lot of coverage in the Civil War lore because it's more exciting to talk about Sherman's march to the sea, right? In the election of 1864, and he burns Atlanta, and Lincoln gets reelected. What Lincoln does to South Carolina, Lincoln, Lincoln, it's not his fault. What Sherman does to South Carolina is arguably worse than he does to Atlanta and Georgia, right? He literally burned the capital of South Carolina to the ground. To the ground. It's gone. Right? Every habitable building burned. Right? Every white person kicked out. Right? The city is basically at the time run by freed slaves because there's nobody else there. Right? So how do we put our country back together from the war? And also, what is the aftermath of emancipation? We have freed these slaves. So for both cases, the question is, now what? How do you put your country back together when you're the one that destroys your own country? It's hard. It's a challenge, it's a struggle. The South is destroyed physically, right? Uh, if we look at 20%, approximately their white male population is either dead or disabled. That's huge. And the, pop the percentage is much bigger in the soldiering age, 18 to 40, the working age. Socially, their society is destroyed. Physically, their, their, their nation, their pretend Confederate states is destroyed. And economically, they're destroyed. The South is destroyed economically because of slavery being gone, because of their dependence on cotton, which is no longer as viable as a one crop staple economy anymore. And all this paper money they just printed leads to hyperinflation. Their prices are all skewed. They have no, no banks, which is, as you guys know, their own fault for being so anti-bank all this time. Uh, they have no resources. They have no trade. They have no workers. They are a hot mess economically, right? So this lost cause of Southern mythology comes out of this sense of loss. But they've lost not just one thing or two things. They've lost literally everything as a society. They've lost what their society was built on. It's gone. Now what? Now what? And that helps us get our mind around why the South is so eager to get back to their race-based society, because it's everything they were built on before. And now that it's gone, it's like, <laughs> I don't know what to do. Go back to the way things were, which is always the answer. All right, how many times you guys have gotten in a fight with your boyfriend or girlfriend and said, I should go back to the way things were? Can't do that. That's old stuff. Go to the next step. Break up, be single, pass your push test. Uh, get rid of your social life. That's the way it works. I probably, are, I probably already did that for you. <laughs> uh, a couple things to issue. We have four million slaves that are freed, but are they freed into worse conditions? Slavery's over, but life still sucks. No money, no land, oftentimes no family, no donkeys. <laughs> well, as you know, that was the chief war vehicle of the Southern War Machine, and they're all dead. Uh, nowhere to go, no food. The picture is dreary, to say the least. Right? Hence, this idea of the Freedmen's Bureau, but they can't solve everybody's problems. Right? There's this, this, this idea, this promise that every slave is promised. It's, it's, it's a gray area whether they're promised or not. 40, bless you, 40 acres and a mule. All they want. I'm going to reference back to this, this phrase in the Civil Rights Movement. All they're at, they're not asking for a handout, not money, not nothing. All they want is 40 acres and a mule. Just give me 40 acres of land, give me a mule to work my land, and I'll be happy. There's this question there. Uh, and then, of course, there's this competing notion, this competing question of what is freedom. Freedom to one person might not mean freedom to somebody else. And reconstruction for everybody, I want this on your notes somewhere, reconstruction is a quest for freedom. For Southern whites, the previous ruling class, they want freedom from foreign oppression. Who's foreign in their case? What foreign oppression are they worried about? Who's oppressing them in their minds? Come on, guys. You say it. Who does the South feel is oppressing them during Reconstruction? Money. 
Yes, Germany's oppressing them. Josh, go ahead. Uh, the union or the yes, the North, the federal government. Yes, that, that they feel this foreign power has invaded and conquered them and they're now oppressing them, imposing their rights on them. Pay attention. They want back to a system of white supremacy. For blacks, their freedom means land. That's their notion of freedom. That for them, being free means access. Access to land, which means access to opportunities, which means access to financial profit. So Reconstruction is a quest for freedom from various sides that we have to acknowledge. So you're going to read a quick piece called An Unreconstructed Southerner by Howell Cobb. I want you to just read it first, annotate it, and then tell me in the column on the side, I didn't put it there, so I want you to listen instead, what is the context, what's happening historically that's leading to this perspective, and what is his point of view? From what point of view was he arguing, and as if you were integrating it into a DBQ? Okay, so I'm going to give you guys six minutes on this. Go. These are a couple of key terms to reference Northerners that I think you should note as well.
one minute left to identify what's the context, what's happening around this perspective. It should be pretty straightforward. What is his point of view regarding reconstruction? Mm -hmm. All right, take 30 seconds, talk to the person next to you. What historical developments are leading to this argument of his? And what's his point of view about reconstruction in general? All right, 30 seconds, go. Talk to him. What's our historical What's happening? What's happening that led him to this point of view? This is the thing. Are they actually? Oh, is it a yeah. and, and what's happened? What is he complaining about? What developments is he in the Can I throw out the whole thing? It just shows how they describe the economy as well as like, like, so that they can victorious or heroic as they, they call them, they reference the North as conquerors. Yeah. All right, let me stop you guys there. Adrian, speak to me. Uh, what developments have led, at least in his mind, to where they currently are in the South? What could he be referencing historically? Yeah, what'd you get from it? That's fine. That'll probably tell me what I'm looking for. Go. Uh, so mm -hmm. it seems that you're being uh, oppressed and uh, that reconstruction is simply favoring the free uh, slaves. Oh, what a con reconstruction's favoring the freed slaves. What a terrible idea. Free, trying to, to support these people that have been in bondage for hundreds of years. Yes. They're feeling oppressed in a way. So what kinds of things would he be referencing that he thinks are oppressing them? Go. Thank you for the hand up. The Freedmen's Bureau. Good. What else? The 13th Amendment. The 14th Amendment. Yes. We're going to give these people, we're going to end slavery and give them citizenship and give them the right to vote and give them a handout to the Freedmen. This is ridiculous. Good. Good, good, good. So his point of view is what then? Uh, Jonathan, what is his point of view regarding reconstruction? It's against reconstruction. It's against reconstruction, be more specific. Because he thinks it will ruin the South. Good. Right. Keep going. Socially, because he states Attaboy. that to make our former slaves our masters. That a boy. Well done. We're back on my good side. Maybe we can be friends later. Good. Good. Yeah, that he thinks socially, and in, there's some economic argument there as well, it's going to ruin the South. Good. Does he want to get reconstructed? Let's try that again. Does he want to be reconstructed? No. 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 Not at all. So let's keep this perspective in mind as we figure out why reconstruction failed. I told you guys on Monday, you can't fix somebody that doesn't think they're broken. You can't train somebody that doesn't want to be trained. You can't improve somebody that doesn't want to be improved. And if this is the prevalent attitude in much of the South, eventually, they're going to win. But I made this argument at the end of the Civil War. I made it again on Monday. I'll make it again today, right? It's a pretty compelling argument to say that the Union won the Civil War. That's fact. But the Confederacy won Reconstruction. And we'll get to that by the end of today as well. So here's our outline of discussion points for today. The first is Jonathan's impeachment, which matters. Because it shows a, a, a level of desperation and, and recklessness by the radical Republicans in Congress. Uh, we'll talk about Grant's presidency. It's terrible. We'll talk about the successes and failures of Reconstruction. The election of 1876 just gives us the compromise of 1877. And then we'll end with this idea of Plessy versus Ferguson as a very foundational court case that matters a whole lot. Uh, but this just being as a, a, a final piece to the Southern redemption 
in their words, right? To redeem the southern states, to put them back the way they were. And that was finalized by Supreme Court validation of what they're trying to do with Plessy versus Ferguson, which we'll get to at the end of today. So Congress, who's controlling Congress? Which party at this time? Republicans. Republicans, good, right? The radical Republicans in Congress, they have this super majority, this veto-proof majority. And they can pass whatever they want, Johnson can veto it, and they can override his veto every single time with that two-thirds majority, making the president powerless. Despite that, they still get a little carried away, shockingly. Power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts, absolutely. Uh, they pass what's called the Command of the Army Act. First of all, who's the commander-in-chief? Who's in charge of the army? The president. Fair. Who's in charge of the presidential cabinet? Don't overthink it. What do you think? Okay. The president. Yeah. I'm just terrified. Wake the hell up. <laughs> it's Thursday. Thursdays are always good. Yes, the president is in charge of the army. He's the commander in chief. The president's in charge of his own cabinet. That's his job. Get that in your head as a fact about these two things. Uh, Congress passes the Command of the Army Act, saying that the president must issue any reconstruction orders through the commander of the military. At the time, the commander of the military is somebody that Lincoln appointed, not Johnson. We'll get there. They also pass the Tenure of Office Act. Bear with me. And it said the president couldn't remove anybody, any officials, especially cabinet members, Secretary of the War, Secretary of the Treasury, Secretary of State, all these important cabinet positions, without the Senate approving. If the job originally required the Senate to approve of them. So tell me how this works, because it doesn't really matter in this class up to now. Right? Uh, a good example is uh, our current president. Right? He had some very controversial picks for his cabinet, shockingly. Uh, Betsy DeVos being one of them, our Secretary of Education. Not for long, I don't think. But we'll get there. Take that out of the video. Um, I'm going to get assassinated by crazy words, man. Um, Betsy DeVos is, uh, is appointed by the president as Secretary of Education. She sneaks by by Senate approval by one vote, a tie-breaking vote. So now she's Secretary of Education. So what this says is if he's going to get rid of that Secretary of Education, the Senate should have to vote on that again. Which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Because if you want to fire somebody and you're the boss, you can just fire them. So this is what they're trying to do here is protect people that who appointed that Lincoln appointed, that Johnson might want to fire. That's, that's the key here, is they're worried, even though they have all this congressional power, they're worried that Johnson might get rid of people that Lincoln had appointed, Lincoln approved, then Lincoln died, and now those people still have those positions in, in, in the executive office because they're positions they had, and now that Johnson is president, he might want to get rid of them. So this is their attempt to protect Lincoln's appointees that Johnson might want to fire. The, the idea here is, is to protect the more radical, more strong punishment for the Republicans, members of what was Lincoln's government, what is now Johnson's government. Uh, they're specifically worried about Edwin Stanton, who's in charge of the War Department, because uh, we're using the military to enforce reconstruction, and therefore it falls under his command. So what are they, this is trying to limit whose power? Who though? Johnson. Johnson, right? They're worried that we have this, this, this Southern Democrat in the White House, despite the fact that uh, Northern radical Republicans are controlling the rest of the government. There's a very strong question about the constitutionality of this law, but the constitutional law or not, because it's taking away the president's power, which the Constitution gives him. But they pass it anyway. Johnson fires Stanton anyway without Senate approval. He fires Stanton, he says, this is my right as president to get rid of people in the cabinet that I don't want to work with. He fires Stanton anyway. So Johnson begins replacing generals in the field who were sympathetic to radical reconstruction. He's replacing them. Oh, you want to punish the South? Let's get rid of you and put somebody a little more sympathetic to the Southerners in charge of the army. 
He's trying to undermine Reconstruction from the inside. What does Congress do? They impeach him. The way it works, I know you guys aren't familiar with this, I grew up in the Bill Clinton era. So I got very familiar with impeachment as like a nine-year-old. And I was like, what is it? Don't ask that question. Um, what is he being impeached for? No, don't worry about it. Uh, lying under oath is what we'll call it. And the way it works is the House of Representatives vote to impeach a president. And if they vote to impeach a president, the president is officially impeached. And then the Senate hears the case and decides if they're guilty or not. And if guilty, they're removed from office. It's a two-thirds majority. So there's enough votes in the House to just impeach Johnson, get rid of him, kick him out. Then it goes to the, by a very a massive, impressive majority, like 82% of the votes, to impeach Johnson. The Senate, however, they hear the trial, that's their job, and they come one vote short, one vote, from removing Johnson from office. At the last minute, a couple of radical Republicans are like, we don't like this precedent. That if we remove him from office, literally just because we don't like him, because he violated a law that we passed to get him in trouble, then we set the precedent that Congress has this power whenever they don't like a president to just get rid of him. So he comes one vote short of being removed from office by the Senate because they're worried about precedent. And, because frankly, what he did is not an impeachable offense. It's not worth getting rid of the president for that. But, this is, and this shows the beginnings of a turning of public opinion, this is why it's important, away from the Republican cause. They appear from doing this as reckless, as power hungry, which they were, uh, and as questionably constitutional. So that was as close as we ever got to removing a president from office. The next time this happens, anybody know? No, before Clinton. Nixon. And rather than go through this process, Nixon just resigns. So he's like, I'm guilty as hell. <laughs> I'm done here. Like, I'm, I'm not going to spare myself. I'm going to spare myself this embarrassment and get out of office now. All right, uh, Nixon resigns, and then Clinton is the next one. And Clinton is, is bound in the Senate not guilty. Okay? Good. Good, good. So they don't remove him off office because they're worried about this precedent. Because what if next time it's them? What if next time it's a Republican president and a Democratic Congress and they're going to vote the president out because they don't like him? All right, it's, a it's a slippery slope, is the idea. And if you do this once, like you establish precedent, you can do whatever you want. And that's dangerous. So we have our uh, election in 1868 to replace Johnson. Uh, he's unique in American history. There's a couple others like him, but, but moderately unique. And that he's a president that never gets a presidential vote cast for him. He didn't run for president. What did he run for? Vice president, right? And then he didn't run for a second term after being president. Uh, so he doesn't have any votes cast for him. And this is the election strategy of Republicans for the next couple, six or so, uh, elections. It's called waving the bloody shirt. Waving the bloody shirt. So take a look at this. Just take 30 seconds with your partner. What is this cartoon trying to lay out about the election? 30 seconds, figure it out with your partner. Go. Yes. What is this trying to show? It's quite easy. It's reflecting how the Democrats succeeded. Before or highlight some things for you. All right. So let me stop you here. I think this is a, a pretty badass cartoon. And it's titled, Tis But a Change of Banners. For context, Seymour and Blair are the Democrats running for president in 1868. And what is the banner we're switching from? Confederate Loud. The Confederate States of America. To? To, um... 
Seymour and Blair. Oh, that's the banner. It says all that banner. Yeah, banner. Yeah, yeah. Good to go. <laughs> right? And what this guy's wearing a Confederate, it's a Confederate soldier, obviously. And what's this guy wearing? <laughs> yeah. So what is this cartoon implying? Give it to me, please. Josh. Yes, who's the same thing? I don't like they and them and we. And therefore, who are Seymour and Blair representing? No. Which party? The Democrats. All right. So this becomes the Republican mantra post-Civil War, and they beat it into the ground like nobody's business. Waving the bloody shirt. Remember what I told you guys on Monday? Not every Democrat seceded. But everyone that seceded was a Democrat, but Republican. That's a badass strategy. So the, it's called the Republican Southern Strategy. I want you to remember this because um, a lovely man by the name of Richard Milhouse Nixon will have a slightly different Southern Strategy that is arguably the same type of thing, right? Appealing to Southern rural poor whites. We'll get there in uh, period seven in a long time, but it'll go like this. So yes, that by voting Democrat. All you're really doing is voting for a return to the Confederacy. In 1864, when we had our last presidential election, this part of the country was out of the country. They were their own country, fighting for the Confederate States of America. Four years later, all that's changed is they gone from a Confederate flag to a political flag. Nothing else is different. And this, this strategy of waving the bloody shirt will be used by Republicans uh, for much of the rest of the 1800s. To the point where we're like, all right, get over it. We all know it happened. Good. Good, good. Now you're going to turn your page, and you're going to look at another deep cartoon that is, I'll let you guys figure out what's happening. I know. I'll give you, I'll give you the details you have to know. It says on the caption, this is a white man's government. Anybody know what this guy is? What does he look like? Irish. Yes, Irish. Good. Irish immigrants are often portrayed as ape-looking. And how does this guy look? Rich. Anybody know who this is? Good. This is... Nathaniel Benford Forrest. Yes, the founder of the KKK. Good. So take a minute with your partner and try to figure out what message this cartoon is getting across. One minute. Go. Cartoon. Maybe borderline one of my favorites. What is it say right here? Nativism. Nativism. What are you pulling out of that? I don't know what that is. Yes. What? Which guy was? Yes. He's trying to hold the flag. Keep going. Where? On his knife? The lost cause. All right. I'm going to give you some more details now. See if that helps. The very bottom, I'll read it for you since I can't read it off of here. I'm all over that terrible eyes. We regard the Reconstruction Acts so-called of Congress as usurpations and unconstitutional, revolutionary, and void. The democratic platform. Because those words are found in the democratic platform in the election of 1868. We talk about platforms a lot. As the Democrats create what they're running for, they put in their platform, this is what we're running for, this is what we're, we're trying to create in our country 
We regard the Reconstruction Acts of Congress as usurpations, unconstitutional, revolutionary, and void. Let me ask you something. If they are trying to declare a law of Congress void, what else have we called that in the past? Nullification. Didn't we settle this idea of nullification three years prior? And this is Northern and Southern Democrats. This is their platform for their president and what they're putting on paper, what we're going to do if we win the election in 1868. But keep in mind that in 1864, in the middle of the Civil War, Lincoln only got 55% of the popular vote in the North which meant 45% of people in the North during the Civil War were pro-separate peace, pro-letting the South be their own country, pro-ending the Civil War as things were, anti-emancipation, anti-13th Amendment. And now here we are, four years later, and the Democrats are putting on paper, Northern and Southern alike, that we want to end Reconstruction, basically. So what this is showing is the Democratic Party is a coalition of who? The Democrats? What freed men do we see up here? Yeah, okay, so therefore not a coalition, not a grouping of free men. Diana, what do you think? This is showing that in this cartoonist perspective, the Democratic Party is a coalition of what groups? Immigrants, good. Who else? The, the, the southern races, the KK, good, and and and, and some people that are rich uh, in the north, largely New York banking. Okay, good. And who do we see on the bottom? A free black. I think it's more than that. Look at his hat. A Union soldier, a black Union soldier who has the flag and is trying desperately, who knows what he's reaching for, anybody? What? No, it's not a globe, it's a ballot box. He's trying desperately to vote. He is a union veteran and potentially a freed slave. And this coalition of Democrats are doing their best to make sure he doesn't. Yes, Barajas. Yes. Yes. Vote. He has a vote, and he has a vote, and he has a vote, and make sure he doesn't have a vote. So, but, so what amendment do you think they're specifically pissed at when they say the, con the, con the Reconstruction Acts? Good, right? And then these enforcement acts as well. Good. You guys are all smarter than you, though. Take me out. Good. So, what's the point of view of this cartoon? From what party? Republican. Good. What's the context? What's happening? Election of 1868. Good, good, good. The purpose, we think we laid out pretty well, to demonstrate in this artist's perspective that Democrats are doing their best to make sure Reconstruction does not work. And the audience is obviously Northern Republican voters and Southern Republican black voters in the election. Good. Good, good. It's a good cartoon. It's a deep one. If you look in the back, there is a man being lynched. And an infant colored uh, asylum being burned, trying to show the what the South's actually doing. Uh, again, this is Nast, the same cartoonist uh, that gave us that white league KKK worse than slavery cartoon. So he obviously has very strong opinions on on what's happening in the South uh, during Reconstruction. Great cartoonist. So 1868, <clears throat> this is what our presidential election looks like. Seymour, the Democratic candidate, wins a good chunk of states, specifically New York. 
Let me ask you, where do the most uh, influential and numerous draft riots take place during the Civil War? New York. New York. Where are most Irish Im immigrants going? New York. So is that accurate to an extent? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So Texas doesn't have votes yet. Mississippi doesn't have votes yet. Virginia doesn't have votes yet because they haven't met their requirements of reconstruction. They don't get to vote until they do. They're not considered a state yet. They're still unreconstructed states. But <clears throat> Grant wins. Here we are, three years removed from the Civil War, only 53% of the popular vote. He does a great job electorally, but this tells a story. This tells me that 47% of America is, at least to a moderate extent, anti-Reconstruction. And you can't win a war without what? Huh. Is there a lot of public support for Reconstruction? No. No, and Grant's presidency is just going to make that worse. So it demonstrates to us that already when things are going well, Reconstruction-wise, the Radical Republicans have full control, they're passing all these amendments, boom, boom, boom. There's still trouble afoot if you look at the data beneath the data. Look, you won 70% of the total vote, sure. But popularly speaking, it's a little uglier. What this also tells me is, let me ask you this. Take a look at this map. If only white people could vote, if only white people could vote, what states would Grant have lost? The entire South, absolutely. Maybe West Virginia. For sure, Arkansas, for sure, Missouri, Tennessee, Alabama, Florida. And now we're looking at a different electoral map. These maps tell us such a good story. It's like that 1856 map that shows us, oh my God, the North could win a presidency without any Southern votes. Let's get ourselves together and win a presidency. And they do, behind Lincoln. This tells me the same thing, that without black votes, Grant doesn't win. For sure the popular vote, potentially the electoral vote. Because we have Democrats winning states like New York, the most populous state. Interesting. So now we see another motivation to keep black people from voting, specifically in the South. This election's close enough, this far, this closely removed from the war? It's terrifying. This, this uh, waving the bloody shirt strategy hasn't lasted very long. So Grant's presidency, Grant, for the record, phenomenal general. Uh, we can give him with Lincoln and Sherman as the three people most responsible for winning the Civil War. Super, super general. He wins at Vicksburg, wins in the West, crushes the Western theater, comes East, and does the same thing. Right? Uh, we, we can argue about his, his validity of some of his tactics. Right? He, he sacrifices tens of thousands of men by basically saying, I have more men than you. Let's go body for body and see how long this lasts. And in a sense, wins the war that way. Great general. Atrocious presidency. Atrocious. It's kind of sad. He's a Republican. And the problem in his presidency is not that he is corrupt, because that's not the case. He's a very, very, very moral man. A man of high moral standing. But in his cabinet is a lot of corruption. People trying to take advantage of the situation, both Reconstruction and Western expansion-wise, which sucks. Now, when we have a Republican presidency with a, this might sound familiar. If we have a Republican presidency with a lot of scandals, what party usually wins the next election? That's what, that's what we're hoping, at least. I'm kidding. Uh, yes, people stop trusting people that are in the middle. Right? If you look at our, our election demographics today in society, we have like 33% that are going to always vote right, 33% that are going to always vote left, and then in the middle is where you win elections. Right? They're going to go that way or that way. If they're all voting Republican in one election, there's a whole bunch of corruption, where are they going to go the next election? Other way. So the problem is people that are kind of in between are going to move away from the Republican Party as a result. Uh, we'll get into some of the specifics of these scandals, uh, like the Tweed Ring and uh, the like in period six, because they're going to matter more in that context of industrialization and westward expansion. But what you have to know about Grant's presidency is that it was plagued with scandals, and as a result,
people trusted the government less. Let's talk about this for a second. It's not even on your notes. Reconstruction and the Civil War together in tandem are the biggest expansion of federal government authority in history up to that point. The biggest expansion of federal government power. All of this stuff. The only thing in American history that rivals this massive expansion of federal authority is the Great Depression and the New Deal and World War II. Only thing that rivals it. But when people stop trusting the federal government, do they want to give the government all that power? No. So we've, get, we've trusted the government up to take all this extra power to win the war and reconstruct the country. But if you don't trust the government, you're going to take that power back and potentially, just maybe, vote for the party that's the party of states' rights. Not federal government supremacy. Hence, Democrats. Grant is thought of by some as the worst president in American history. I think that's a little bit harsh. Uh, but he's not on anybody's top presidential list. Put it that way. Grant's administration is plagued by scandals which are unprecedented. Because of the growth of the country after the Civil War, the massive industrialization that takes place that will hit hard in period six, the massive westward expansion that takes place, all of these expansions industrially, population-wise, territorially, all of these expansions all give right opportunity for corruption. We have the credit mobilier scandal, which is important, uh, which deals with railroads. Government officials getting kickbacks from railroad companies for giving them land grants and the like. It's complicated. We have the whiskey ring with uh, Boss Tweed in the beginnings of machine politics in New York City. This idea of patronage, of political corruption, of trading votes for favors, uh, which, which gives rise to the question of letting immigrants vote because they don't know what they're in for and they're, they're prey to things like political machines. We'll get that hard in period six as well. And the Indian ring too. And this just shows, this is making fun of, we'll figure out who. I beg to repeat that these frauds of the government shall be probed to the very bottom. And he's just going and there's freaking scandal after scandal. Who do you think this is? Great. Good. Right? He's the one saying, I'm, I'm going to get to the bottom of this. And he's trying. And it's not his fault, but when you surround yourself with, with corrupt people, they can do corrupt things. As he's going, it's scandal after scandal, and here he is, Uncle Sam, trying to figure it all out. Uh, and he can't get to the bottom because there's too much scandal. So that's Grant's presidency to begin with. Not good? Not good. And then we get the panic of 1873. Right? Like, we, look, we, we feel bad for Martin Van Buren because he becomes president after Jackson. And he's like, cool, I'm president. And it's like, oh, no, panic of 1837. Economy's in the tank. He gets one, one term and he's done. Not even his fault. Right? Poor Martin Van Ruin. Grant oversees the panic of 1873, which is the worst financial crisis in American history until the Great Depression. Until the Great Depression. Now we can rank it third depending on how you want to measure these things, behind the Great Depression and the Great Recession of my teenage and early 20 years uh, of, of, of what he's doing. The U.S. economy goes into a severe, severe recession with 2 million unemployed people out of 36 million. So 1 in 18 is unemployed. That's a lot at the time. There's two causes. The first cause is Civil War currency. We've printed so much money without really any financial backing, and now we're having serious debates about what to do about that money. Should we pay it back with specie, with hard currency, or should we let people keep using paper money for everything with no backing? Right? Very much like the Panic of 1837 that's caused by Jackson killing the bank and that specie circular that you can't buy land on paper notes anymore, just hard currency. Same debate. And the other thing that uh, causes it, the overextension of industry. But this is always the cause of all of our panics. Panic of 1837, overextension of land. Panic of 1819, overextension of westward expansion and land and loans. Panic of 1873, overextension of industry. This time, specifically railroads. We've, we've lent too much money and too much stuff for railroads to build. Now there's a freaking railroad everywhere. 
And now people are, there's more of them than we need, and therefore that causes us to collapse economically. Bless you. Great Depression, overextension of credit, overextension of buying on margin, overextension of the stock market. It's always an overextension. That's the point I want you to get here, is that all of our panics are caused by the same thing. Question of currency and overextension. It's just a matter of overextension of what? In this case, industry. Because of this, people are going to look to Democrats to fix their problems. Do Democrats have, Democrats have the problem? Solution? Excuse me. I don't know. Maybe. But they're not Republicans. So in this case, because of the corruption of Grant and the economics that take place, we just blame the government in charge, regardless if that's accurate or not. Much like uh, elect picking Harrison and uh, Taylor over Van Buren for re-election. Was Van Buren a better option? Probably, but he was president of the panic of 1837, so we should go with the other party. I always, with financial panics, we go the other way. So the combination of political scandals and economic crisis leads us to look more democratic. Also happening during Grant's presidency, which is not Grant's fault in this case, are some legal challenges to Reconstruction that you have to know. The radicals in Congress passed the Civil Rights Act of 1875. Does that sound like a good law? Absolutely, it's a Civil Rights Act. What it said was we're going to have equal access for all people, regardless of race, to public places. What are, what's an example of a public place? Bathrooms. Bathrooms. What else? That's also restrooms and bathrooms are in general the same thing, yes. What else? Parks? Libraries. Libraries. Buses. Schools. Schools. Post offices. Courthouses. Juries. Jury selection. So my question is, and I'll let you talk about this with your partner for a second, why... Did the radical Republicans in Congress think this was necessary to pass, despite the already present presence of a 14th and 15th Amendment? Take a second, chat it out. Why? Go. Mm -hmm. Probably they think that the 14th Amendment was, was like useful. Why? Them, but then at the same time, they were still not given like, no really freedom. Like, All right, let me stop you guys there. In theory, in theory, is this act necessary? Yes. Why? Because um, everyone with this high school is a newly freed uh, black student. Yes. So then ever since the whole, um, the Confederates saw that they were gaining more um, mm -hmm. rights, they didn't like that. So they did everything in their power, like they must freedom of zero. They were kicking them out and all that stuff. So they felt that it was necessary. But in theory, would you need to guarantee this if people actually listen to the letter of the law of the 14th and 15th Amendments? You see my point? What this tells me is, is Congress, the radicals in Congress, are already looking at the South and saying, we need to do more to reconstruct the South. We need to pass more laws because we're not going to be in power forever. And we need to put as much stuff on the books as possible to make sure that, that freed slaves and other African Americans still have rights once our Congress, our radical Republicans, are no longer in power. Sad point. This is the last piece of civil rights legislation. The last law passed to support civil rights for 90 years. So I argue that the Confederacy wins Reconstruction for 90 years. So that's important, and the problem here is there's no enforcement mechanism. There's no way to force states to listen to this law. 
There's no, if you don't, this will happen. There should have to be enforcement mechanisms for law. But if we pass a new uh, speed limit, for example, that's 40 miles an hour, and nobody enforces it, will anybody listen? No. 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 Now, we're going to go through these one at a time, and I want you to just get in, what do they all have in common? And these are all Supreme Court cases. They're all Supreme Court cases. The first are these called these slaughterhouse cases. In this case, the court took a very strict, here, here this is again, I told you it wasn't going away. Not a loose interpretation, but a strict interpretation of the 14th Amendment. Which said that states have the authority, not the federal government has the authority, to decide citizens' rights. Here we go again. Back to our question of states' rights. States' rights to do what? In this case, it's not slavery, it's citizenship. Then this, in this case, slaughterhouse cases said that, yeah, states can't decide based on what the 14th Amendment says, but the federal government doesn't get to decide citizens' rights, that's a state's decision. Chalk one in the column for which party? Democrat. Democrat, right? Back to, no, states can decide. In 1873, a female attorney in Illinois, a northern state, or Midwest state, but northern during the war, sues for her right to practice law. She said, I have the right to be a lawyer. I'm going to sue to have my right to be a lawyer protected. She says the 14th Amendment says that all people born here are citizens. I'm born here. Therefore, the government can take away my rights. My right in this case is to be an attorney. You do have the right to be an attorney. And in this case, the Supreme Court rules, first of all, Miss Bradwell, you are a woman, which means you shouldn't even be here suing us in the first place. So no, you don't have the right to practice law because you're a woman and you should not be doing this at all. Sounds like good dress code. Thank you. That was my next question. What case does this sound like? Dred Scott. Dred Scott. Yeah, not only are you not free, Mr. Dred Scott, but you are black and should not be here suing in the first place because you are not a citizen at all. Very similar to the Dred Scott logic. So therefore, by this precedent here, 14th Amendment doesn't apply to women because women aren't citizens. There it is. Because there were some questions when you passed it. Well, this, this is all people born here. All these born. Do they get to vote? No, you don't. Two more, U.S. versus Crike Shank in 1876. In this case, a group of Louisiana white supremacists have attacked a meeting of African Americans. Remember from Monday, we have these enforcement acts that allows the army to persecute people who are doing acts of racism, specifically KKK. So they are persecuted, I'm sorry, prosecuted. They're brought to court and convicted under the enforcement acts. That you are guilty of violating the enforce, uh, violating the Equal Rights Amendment and these things because uh, you, sorry, the, uh, the Civil Rights Act, not Equal Rights Amendment, that's later. The Civil Rights Act, you're guilty under the, this because of the Enforcement Acts. The court rules, no, nope, no. Nope. The Citizenship Clause in the 14th Amendment only applies to states discriminating, not people. So now all of a sudden, if you are a person or a business, this amendment doesn't apply to you. It just says the states can't take your citizenship rights away. But a business or a person maybe can. Again, strict interpretation. States' rights logic. And finally, U.S. v. Reese. The Supreme Court rules that the states decide who can vote, not the federal government. The 50th Amendment doesn't guarantee any right to vote. Even though it says the government shall not take away your right to vote based on race, color, or previous condition of servitude. But their argument here is that, oh, that just says the federal government can take away your right to vote, not the states. I know. So all of these decisions are a very narrow enforcement of the language of the amendments. A very narrow enforcement of the language amendments. And I want you to sit here and chat for a second. What is all of this going to lead to? 30 seconds. What kind of stuff is this going to lead to? Go. Mm -hmm. So now with this case, it's like all the 
What? Tony. 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 Mm -hmm. okay. Roger, Tony? Yeah. Fifteen seconds. Maybe the right along. Okay, what's like something? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, All right. <laughs> so, what kinds of things can we expect this to lead to? Menace, what do you think? A press cow. What kind of rights? Yeah, public places, voting, education, all of those things that really, really matter. Why does voting matter? Because people you vote for pass the laws. If only white southerners vote for who's in Congress and who's the mayor and who are the local judges, then you only have white people making the law and interpreting the law. Males. Things down here can lead us to things like uh, separate areas on the bus. That's not the state discriminating, that's a business discriminating. It's a person discriminating. Uh, whites only restaurants. Down here, Voting rights. A state can pass a law, because states can do whatever they want with voting, right? The federal government can't take your right away based on color. States can pass laws like literacy tests. You gotta pass this reading test to vote. Things like poll taxes. You gotta pay to vote. Which basically is just a, a way to keep poor people from voting. Well, unless you're white, then we'll waive the tax. Things like grandfather clauses. You can only vote in this county if your grandfather voted in this county. Well, my grandfather was a slave, and so was my father, and so was I. So, no, I can't vote, apparently. So these are chipping away at the legal effectiveness of Reconstruction. And now we've looked at three different things. Politically, grant scandals that let us trust the government less, therefore we give them less power, therefore Reconstruction won't work. Economically, when we're all in a real big bind for our own money, we don't want to pay a bunch of money for things like the Freedmen's Bureau and things like welfare programs for somebody else. And legally, each of these court cases establishes precedent for court cases after, which they then follow this precedent to make their decision. Very, very important. So this gives us our situation of Northern supports waning. These are the reasons. Grantism. The word grantism becomes synonymous with corruption, which is always bad. When your presidency is, is titled like that, grantism, we'll talk about this later with Hoover a lot in the Great Depression. Grantism and corruption leads to less support for the government, therefore less support for government policies, therefore less support for reconstruction. The Panic of 1873 means we want to spend less money on other people when we're all unemployed. Very, very true. Concern becomes more focused on westward expansion and Indian Wars, which we'll cover in period six, by trying to close the frontier and spread out and get all wild in the west. And then these monetary issues, which are always the issue. Should the government get rid of all those paper dollars issued in the Civil War, $432 million worth? That becomes a big political issue, which takes our focus away from Reconstruction. And the final question being, should war bonds, these loans to the government that people pay for the Civil War with, war bonds are important, should we pay them back with greenbacks, with paper, paper dollars, or should we pay them back with specie, with hard currency? All of these issues take us away from focusing on Reconstruction, and Reconstruction is the kind of issue that everybody needs to be focused on to work. We would have needed the army in the South for 40 years to change two generations of mindsets. We were in the South for 40 years, we were in the South for 12 years. And we'll get to that in the next point. So that leads us to our next election, the election of 1876. It's a complicated election, but I don't need you to know much. I don't. 
What I need to know is Republicans nominate Rutherford B. Hayes. It's a lovely name. It's a very 19th century name. Any of you guys have a friend named Rutherford? No? No? It's because you don't have friends. You should make a friend named Rutherford. You don't have me at all. That's definitely not the case. Democrats nominate Samuel J. Tilden. We all have a friend named Samuel. Samuel Arias. In this case, we have a very, I don't need to know specifics, what I need to know is it's a contested election. The votes are contested or challenged in three states, Louisiana, Florida, and South Carolina. Three states in the South. There's some shady election stuff happening. Uh, and the vote, the, there's two different... One group says Republicans won, one group say Democrats won in all three states. So there is this big question of who's the next president. That's a big problem. Congress creates a special commission, an electoral commission, to decide which side gets the votes. The commission votes eight to seven to give all of the votes to Hayes. Therefore, Hayes wins the presidency. Who's that good for? Republicans, yeah. What region is that good for? Yeah, sure. Democrats, however, threatened to what's called filibuster. You'll get into next year in Gov. Basically, mean not accept the results until they get changed. To hold up the Senate, not do any other business until the votes get changed, and send the election to the House instead, where Democrats already have the advantage. So it's very. It's the only time this ever happened in American history. And, and the question is, who's going to be the next president? And there's talk in the South of marching on Washington, D.C. and starting another civil war, because that worked out so well the last time, <laughs> of marching on Washington, D.C., starting another civil war, uh, because in their minds, the Republicans were stealing the election. Which you could argue was accurate. Here's a cartoon I want you to spend a couple minutes with. It's confusing, it's, it's, it's dense. I'm going to give you two minutes. I don't need you to answer the question. I need you to figure out what this cartoon is trying to say. Two minutes, go. If Hayes and Wheeler have received the 850 electoral votes in the field, they will be inaugurated in the US. What is this cartoon trying to portray? Was Hayes the one that disarmed the military in the South? No. I think you should pay special attention to what's in his left hand. Our constitution system is not a, ma a magazine or a powder. Um, notice to his glitters if this continues, Uncle Sam will not have a sound hair in his head. All right, so let's talk about this for a second. Yes. Sure, she can ask. She's a big girl. This says at the bottom, compromise indeed. Maybe sarcastically. Who do we assume this is? What? 
Southern, Southern what supporters? Southern, Southern Democrat supporters. And who do we assume this is? No, not Republicans. That's too simple. Who's deciding the election? No. The, spe the special elect to this commission, this group in Congress, in the Senate, is deciding who's going to be president. So this is arguing that the only reason they're even debating this is the Southern Democrats are threatening tilted or death to the Electoral Commission. Tilden, you will have if elected, or blood, you should have if you shed any. Fraud, intimidation, assassination, threat of war. Interesting. This is also Thomas Nast. Now you've seen three Nast cartoons, just in the past two classes. And he is arguing that, that the Democrats are holding the country hostage by forcing Tilden on us. It's funny, huh? Hilarious. By forcing Tilden on us. Now, go ahead. Why is um, Uncle Sam involved? Saying hair splitters and discontinuous? Good question. Notice to hair splitters. If this continues, Uncle Sam will not have a sound hair in his head. What are they threatening? Yeah, to go to war, right? You know, this idea of like, Uncle Sam's not going to have a hair left on his head because they're going to cause another civil war. So the point of view of this is Republican, arguing that Democrats are holding the country hostage, arguing the country, that the Democrats are, are threatening war or their candidate, and yet the election still picks Rutherford B. Hayes. We think, we think the North will be happy with that, but we need to make sure the South doesn't start into the Civil War. Because compromise has always been our answer, hasn't it? It's always worked out so well for the slaves and then the free black people. Hence, our compromise of 1877. Hayes wins support. Hayes wins support of the House of Representatives who decides the election. Hayes wins support in exchange to take the federal troops out of the South. Yep. So the troops are gone. The South will be left to do what the South is going to do, which is probably not ideal for freed slaves. The army that Congress has sent to the South to force Reconstruction, to supervise these amendments, to make sure that the freed slaves are being able to vote. This Congress, is called, this army is called back. By President Rutherford B. Hayes. You could argue that he traded his presidency for Reconstruction. He says, support me, Congress, with Democrats largely back in charge, and I will take the army out of the South. So he gets to be president, and Reconstruction, in a sense, ends. Because without anybody there to enforce the laws, what's the South going to do? Whatever they want. This effectively ends military supervision in the South, which means that as you read from other people's accounts and the KKK, like, the South's gonna go back to doing the things they've always done. This leaves Southern Democrats largely in favor of segregation back in control. Southern Democrats are back in charge politically, which means they are in charge economically and socially, which means the union as it was the Constitution as it is, pre-14th and 15th Amendment. So what does, my question for you was, what was the benefit to the North of the Compromise? What does the North win? The presidency. Cool. What does the South win? Everything else. The return to home rule. The return of states' rights. The return of doing things the way they want to do things. And again, it's important we know that the Compromise of 1877 does not end Reconstruction. It, ends, it, doesn't, it isn't the cause of the end of Reconstruction, it just ends Reconstruction. Uh, people have called this the third corrupt bargain. Right back to our Quincy Adams versus Jackson conversation, where a trade for this is a trade for that. 
Uh, in this case, Southern Democrats, they give up what they want for president. In return, they get control back of their state to do whatever they want. Synthesis. Synthesis. That'd draw. So tell me, Reconstruction. Why did it end? Tell me, talk to your partner for a second. Why does it end? Go. Wait, that did suck. Why does it end? All right, stop you there. Steph, why does it end? There's a lot of factors and reasons, just give us one. Everything they implied, like there was, um, there was something else that will like contradict that. Mm -hmm. What did it? Um, basically, there was already more there on our ideology compared to what the party wanted. Ah, in an ideological conflict, you can't change ideology in twelve years. Good point. Good point. Josh, why did it end? No, that's why though. Because <laughs> one could that then no more. Uh, Enforce the okay, but why? Huh? Why were we in a place where we needed a compromise of 1877? No, Margaret. You can't change morality, so you could enforce it. Ah, uh, you can't legislate morality, but you can enforce laws. And if you stop enforcing laws, you let people go back to their morality, in this case, their morality being based strongly on racial segregation. Oh boy, using my own words against me. <laughs> I see you. I like you. Ventura, yeah. the other Kevin. <laughs> Why did Reconstruction end? What? Uh, they took all the good <laughs> ideas? Oh my god. I hate you. <laughs> There's a lot of ideas. I heard you talking about economics. Talk to me. Oh, um, it's kind of like the thing they said, like, um, since the military is already gone from there, like, there's really no way that, like, we could, like, I don't know, like, they're just. Go. Because the Democrats gain public support. The Democrats gain public support. That's it. Like, why do we even need a compromise in the first place? Because Democrats had received enough votes in the presidential election that it was basically tied. That tells me that public support has changed and no longer supports this all out effort. Because it was an all out effort, financially, politically, socially to fix the South. But again, if the South doesn't think they're broken, how do you make them fix? It's like me and you guys in your homework. You always look up when I say that, don't you, Adrian? <laughs> if you don't think you're broken, then I can't fix you. The North lost their support for Reconstruction because it wasn't working, because it wasn't changing minds, because you can't legislate morality. You can't pass laws to make people less racist. You can pass anti-segregation laws. It doesn't change people's mindsets. And that's important. But yes, Josh, to your point, why does it end? The Compromise of 1877. That's what ends it. But the Compromise settles the disputed election. Hayes becomes president. And the big piece to know from this Compromise is it ends military rule in the South. He even appoints a Southerner to his cabinet. First time a Southerner has held a cabinet position since before the Civil War. And now my question is now what? What's the impact of the end? The impact is quite straightforward. Jim Crow laws, which we'll go into in a second. Which are then upheld by Plessy v. Ferguson. Plessy v. Ferguson has not been in your textbook yet because it's not passed until the 1890s. But in this case... The Supreme Court rules that it is totally fine to segregate people. I can make you go to one school and you go to another school just based on your color 
if those schools are equal. But the idea of segregation is inherently disequal. So the Supreme Court rules that all the stuff the South is going to do in the next 30 years is cool, as long as it's separate. Separate water fountains are cool as long as it's the same water. Separate parts of the bus are fine as long as it's the same bus. Several places to eat are fine as long as it's the same kind of, it's not as long as it's equal. And significantly, I'm going to argue more so than Jim Crow laws, is the disenfranchisement of black people in the South and the North. The taking away of their right to vote. Because when you can't vote, people are making laws that don't apply to you. Isn't that what we fought the Revolutionary War for? Representation? No taxation without representation? Interesting. The southern states then go through a process of what's called, in Reconstruction terms, redemption, of putting things back to the way they were. This is why it makes sense demographically. States in the upper south, the, uh, Kentucky, Tennessee, Missouri, Arkansas, borderline in Virginia, they already have a white majority. So they have no problem just voting in white people that have their kind of ideology. No problem. In the states where black people have the majority, Louisiana, almost Mississippi, South Carolina, white people use in intimidation and violence to keep reconstruction from working. We have the KKK, as you guys know, the Knights of the White Camellia, white leagues are forcing white people to join Democrats so they don't vote with anybody else to keep power where they want power to be. Uh, so using political intimidation as well as economic intimidation, right? Landowners not renting their land to black people that voted. What matters more to you, paying your bills or voting? You think that. That's a nice idea, but if your choice is, is somewhere to live or somewhere to, to vote, we're all going to vote with somewhere we have to live. So by this system of redemption, the southern states are able to then, within the next five to six years, elect all southern states' rights, segregationist Democrats to control southern state governments. Just like that, Reconstruction is over. And the only thing that's changed is slavery. Which is a big, it's a big thing to have changed, but they evade the 15th Amendment. They avoid the voting amendment of the 15th with things like poll taxes. If you're stuck in a system of sharecropping, you can't even pay your bills, how are you going to pay to vote? You can feed your family or you can vote. What are you picking? You can feed your family. Literacy tests, which are incredibly unfair. Hundred percent. We'll take a literacy test uh, at boot camp one of these Saturdays. I have a, I have the Louisiana literacy test, uh, and we'll take it, and you'll all fail because you're all illiterate. No, because the test is unfair. And then grandfather clause, grandfather laws. Okay. Uh, a court case, another Supreme Court case we should note is Williams v. Mississippi, in 1890. Which said, yeah, literacy tests are cool. You can make people read a literacy test to vote. Interesting. And then this Jim Crow South is this idea of slavery by another name, a very elaborate system of segregation that reaches everything. Juries are all white. Because you gotta be a voter to serve on a jury. Well, you can't vote. And now when we go, people go on, on trial and the and the, the jury's all white, what do we expect the case if it's a if it's a, a, a black defendant? City councils are all white. Mayors are all white. Police forces are all white. So of course, this segregation interjects itself into every part of Southern life. All right, this allows the white South to retain the kind of control they had pre-Civil War, with the only difference being no more slavery. In the 1890s, we see a huge increase in white violence towards black people. There's an average of about 190 lynchings per year. That's a problem. It's a problem we'll revisit within the progressive era of the 1900s and 1910s of authors trying to expose this problem to the society. Prisoners in small southern cities are taken when accused of a crime that they did or didn't commit against a white person are taken from prison and hanged in front of large audiences. The big southern party. We'll see pictures next year. Don't you worry. 
allowing Southern white people to control black populations, not through slavery, but through terror. Political control, economic control, social control, terror control. By 1877, with the election, that was the last step, every Southern state was redeemed, in their words. White Democrats in charge at basically every level of government. Reconstruction is a huge moment in American history, but it's short-lived. By the election of two black senators, that's a big deal. The election of black members of the House of Representatives, it's a big deal. But by 1877, white Democrats are back in control of every level of Congress. Every local level, every state level, every national level. The South falls into control of a powerful conservative Democratic oligarchy. Not much different than it was before the Civil War. Known as the Redeemans or the Bourbon Democrats. Bourbon Democrats. Their, their big platform is home rule, their own decisions, states' rights, social conservatism, and, 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 and to an extent, some new southern economic development. Democrats do things that Democrats often, that states' rights groups often do in this time. They cut taxes, they reduce government spending, welfare programs, cut taxes, cut, and they, and they drastically limited state services. Free Men's Bureau, cut. Education, cut. Anybody that disagreed politically was crushed. And there's no real other way to do things because of things like the KKK, the White League, and the like. Now the last thing that I'll talk on for a minute is the economics of the post-Civil War South. Many in the South believe they lost the Civil War because of the lack of industrialization. Isn't that funny? I told you that was coming in like August. They lost the war because they had a weak industrial economy. Now the goal of the New South, their goal in some pockets, is to out-Yankee the Yankees. To become the industrialized economy the North is. Southern literature is depicting the antebellum South, the pre-Civil War South, with nostalgia. And we begin this lost cause ideology. Portraying Southern slave owners as nice and fatherly, and the slaves as happy. Uh, we, those of you in the African American Studies class, you've seen this ideology, you've seen this literature. It's not the reality by any stretch of the imagination, but it becomes prevalent in the South and then all of America after the Civil War. By limiting black voices after the Civil War, you limit the story of what actually took place in slavery. We started seeing textile factories in the South. We started seeing iron as, as the big mining, iron ore as the big mining resource in the South. That's important. We see women working in these places, but African Americans being barred. So African Americans have one job, one option for jobs, and it's farm labor. We see some efforts to unionize in southern factories that are crushed very quickly, but we'll talk about that in period six as well. And then I talked about that uh, um, convict leasing, arresting freed slaves for, for minimal crimes giving them long sentences, and then allowing them to then work back on the same types of plantations they were slaves on. Good, good. All right, so take a second. We're going to read Frederick Douglass, Complaints on Reconstruction, and we're going to read a freed slave, Lee Guidance, Lay My Burden Down. I'm going to give you five minutes on Douglass, and you're going to tell me what is his historical context? I didn't give you the date on purpose. What is his? What is it? What's happening in the world around him? For this piece, and then from Lee Guidance, uh, what are, what realities of Reconstruction is he identifying? What historical realities talked about are present in his writing? So I'm going to give you five, and then five, and then we'll break it down as a class. Go.